Welcome to Successful Dementia Moves, a topic that is very near and dear to our heart, as I'm sure it is to yours as well. I'm Erin DiCarlo. I'm the founder and president at Dovetail Companies. I created this presentation with my fearless co-leader, Lauren Watts, and Barbara Lenahan. Um, she is a RN who comes from many years as a resident care director in assisted living and memory care, and also a nurse in hospice. She is a team leader and a transition expert here at Dovetail Companies, supporting our clients and their families through these major life transitions and moves. We are certified senior advisors, certified dementia practitioners, seniors, real estate specialists, uh, certified care managers, certified senior move managers, and age at home specialists. So here at Dovetail, we provide older adults and their families one point of contact for all the various services they may need when facing a major life transition. And one thing we know for sure is that there are really good lives to be lived in our senior living community partners, communities, and it doesn't have to be so hard. I think the biggest challenge in our industry is that we live in an ageist society where people put on their blinders and don't have a plan for when things happen. And people are making these major decisions and experiencing transitions um, in crisis. So I want to briefly talk about what we're going to talk about today, which are kind of the four areas, the four pillars that make up a successful move. And um, it's really the four pillars of someone's transition. So the first is engagement, not only engagement with that prospective resident, but with the team back at the community, both sides of engagement directly with this person and with the team members at the community in which you're working with. The timing, um, how to do this well, we'll talk a lot about this, has to do with a gentle, slow approach. And if we're in crisis mode or if we have time with what we call a long runway, um, the longer the runway, the better when working with anyone, especially with an older adult with cognitive impairment. Communication is key to success, not only communication with the family, but within our interdisciplinary teams. So not only at the community level, but with all of the supportive professionals working with this prospective residents. So if there's a home care company, a visiting nurse, a primary care physician, a social worker, geriatric therapist, whoever's involved, we need a really strong collaborative communication in place. And then the environment. Not only looking at the functional aspects of someone's environment, um, but recreating a very familiar space for this person to successfully transition and have the ability to ground themselves in a new environment. All right, so I just touched on this briefly, but what are the scenarios in which we see people experiencing this transition? It's either total crisis, someone is thrown into an, a situation where it's complete chaos and something has to happen. It's not a sustainable situation. And so things have to happen really quickly. What we see often is the second scenario, which is there maybe is a diagnosis, the family starts to look at options and put a plan together and then things get put on hold because someone has stabilized a little bit and then something else happens. And so people can become derailed in this process. Um, I think as humans, we have good intentions, but we're human and life happens and family dynamics happen and we get derailed from our plan and our progress forward. Um, what we like to see is that there's small but progressive steps being made in the right direction. So a sustainable situation is, you know, there's a diagnosis and then we have home care in place. And then as things are increasing, we're starting to tour communities. Our goal as an organization and our goal for all of you is for an A to B streamlined all of the ducks in a row so that the person is feeling supported, their family has the information and resources needed to make this process not only effective, but enjoyable. There's joy to have along the way with this, the various disease processes of, of different cognitive impairment diagnosis. How do we give the right support to people so that they can enjoy their days, craft a future that makes sense for them and live their life to the best of their ability? Like I, my whole reason for being and doing and, and, and running Dovetail Companies is for people to live their best life, regardless of their diagnosis and their situation. And with the right support and the right collaboration, 
And as you see at the community level, people are able to do that. So we're excited to, to share today some tips and tricks to make this less painful and more easier for all involved. All right, so what are some of the common challenges that are faced when looking at this transition? So family dynamics, um, when you've seen one, you've not seen them all. Every family's done different. Obviously, there are some common denominators with situations that we see, um, but that can be a big challenge is just education, getting everyone on the same page with the situation, with the diagnosis um, and what needs to happen. That piece alone can take a lot of time, especially depending on the number of influencers involved. And when we say influencer, we're not only referring to family members, there may be a best friend who's chiming in, who's trying to steer the ship. There may be an elder law attorney who has a different viewpoint and is giving different advice to the family or the older adult. There's a lot of different people involved and getting a, a really good gauge on who are the influencers in the situation and how do we bring everyone onto the same page. That can be a major challenge. Lack of information or too much information. So a common challenge is we're just starting at zero and families just don't know what's available to them. And so it's overwhelming and time consuming to even begin researching where to go and what to do. We're the opposite. I don't know about you, but I see this pretty frequently with the internet nowadays and Google people are derailed by too much information. The options, diagnose, self-diagnosing, um, just reading articles on what they should or shouldn't do. So they are in an, what I call analysis paralysis. They have all this information, but they're stuck because they don't know how to disseminate the information well. Denial, I say this all the time, this quote, denial is a very real form of self-preservation. If I don't see it, it's not happening. And it's done on a subconscious level. It's just how we survive sometimes through tough patches. So what are some really understanding a challenging situation or what are someone's perceptions of the current situation versus really what's going on? And I'm sure you've all experienced this too, but parent-child role reversal, I don't know if I have this here. I don't think I have this here, but oftentimes we see the adult child thinks that their parent is not realistic, is in denial about their situation or their diagnosis, but really they're trying to save face with their adult child. They don't want the child having to step into a role reversal situation where they feel like they're being the, you know, they're being parented by their child. And so when we engage the older adult directly in this process and they feel heard and there's trust and rapport, regularly we hear from the senior a very realistic description of their situation and their diagnosis. And the children are always surprised to hear that mom or dad was so honest with us. And it's because they're trying to save face with the child, but we create a safe space where they know that it's okay to talk about the realities of their diagnosis and their situation, what is scaring them, you know, what are their biggest concerns? And that's a big piece on engaging the older adult. And that's a challenge sometimes is what level of reality are we dealing with? I am going to venture to say, I think professionally, the largest challenge with dementia moves is time limitation because of ages and because of family dynamics, because of all of these other things, we haven't been given a long runway to engage this prospective resident in the process and hear what's important to them and establish trust and rapport to allow this to happen well and with ease. So time limitations for me as a professional that's brought in many times at the last minute, if I could change one thing, it's usually time. Because these other things we can change with time, uh, we can address them, but time is something we can't change. So that I wanna hit that home hopefully a few times today is that we all as professionals supporting people with dementia, need to be involved much earlier on in the process. Numerous recent transitions. This is a huge challenge. How many times has this person changed their environment? Have they gone from home to emergency room to home to daughter's house, back to hospital to a rehab, and now we're asking them to go to another environment? Or have they never left the comfort of their home? And we're asking them to go from a place they've literally been for 60 plus years to a completely new environment. Both of those scenarios have major challenges. Financial concerns. 
because we didn't know and we didn't plan well and we didn't think about cognitive impairment or care needs later in life, how are we going to pay for this? This isn't something that was in our wheelhouse. We've been doing a lot of work lately with financial firms, financial planners, and it's been really um, fulfilling to educate that group of professionals to how to support people to plan much earlier in life for this future need. Communication challenges. This is, um, you know, they say to communicate to someone the way in which they choose to communicate themselves not just the challenges of someone being with dementia, being able to process words and verbal communication, but maybe it's a family that never openly communicated about life situations. It's not gonna change now. How do we support the different communication challenges that the person themselves with the cognitive impairment diagnosis has, but also the communication style within the family, the communication style within the communities in which they're moving to, communication can be a huge barrier for successful transitions. And then expectations. How are we setting realistic expectations so that they can be met at each, at each milestone along the way um, instead of you know giving pie in the sky expectations that can never be delivered? Let's break that down into small, manageable, realistic expectations that can be achieved. So I wanna talk a little bit about the psychosocial approach to this transition. Lauren and I here at Dovetail Companies study something called positive psychology. Positive psychology is uh, probably 20 or 25 years old of, of a practice. And Martin Seligman, who's one of the founders of pos the positive psychology movement, talks about uh, well-being. So obviously nowadays, like, you know, self-care and well-being and holistic approach are all things that are kind of thrown out into the atmosphere for all of us, regardless of your age or diagnosis. But essentially, he talks about there are five pillars that comprise someone's level or state of well-being. And I have completely dove into this model because I think it's relevant to all, but especially to older adults and more importantly, with people suffering from dementia. So we need to look at the five pillars that make up someone's well-being, okay? And then how do we address and approach and support within each one of these pillars to help this person thrive and not just survive? So traditional psychology is something's wrong, you're not well, you're below a zero, you're suffering in some way, whether it's from anxiety, depression, whatever it may be. And traditional psychology is how do we get you just to the basic zero of not suffering? Positive psychology is, I don't know about you, but I don't wanna just survive. I'd like to be better than a zero in this life. I'd like to find some joy and engagement and thrive at any point in my life. And so positive psychology is how do we get people above that zero? So for the it's called the PERMA model of well-being. So first pillar is positive emotion, looking at someone's life, engaging them in this conversation to be able to understand the depths of these five pillars. How much positive emotion is this person? And I'm gonna challenge you as professionals on this call today. This is equally, if not more important for you to look at in your own life because you're, you're doing heavy work. You're supporting people that really need you and you can only be the best version of yourself to them if you do the work as well. So how much positive emotion does this person or do you, if you're looking at this for yourself, have in your day? How much feel good emotion is happening in this person's life? And taking that one step further, finding out from them, what are those things that lift, you know, that bring them good joy and good feeling? When in their life did they have those positive emotions? So we can start to tie that back to figure out their why. What are the things in their life that lift them up? Engagement. How much true engagement are they having in their lives where they're fully engaged and engrossed in an activity that is not only enjoyable, but is challenging? Engagement. There needs to be some level of challenge to be truly engaged. You know, just listening to, depending on the person. I mean, if I'm a symphony lover and I'm truly engaged in listening to, to uh, an orchestra, that's different. But just pleasant background music is not necessarily an engagement opportunity. We'll talk more 
throughout this presentation how to do each of these. Relationships, what are their relationships look like in their life? How many people are they truly engage in a deep relationship? And a relationship is a give and take. It's not just one person supporting them. We're not referring to just a caregiving relationship. Is their best friend involved? Were they, you know, part of a knitting club and they had deep friendships within that knitting club, but the knitting club no longer exists? What are their deep relationships look like? We all have a need as humans to have a deeper meaning and purpose to our life. What's that bigger reason of being? Does this person feel that they're doing something above and beyond their self to help others or whatever that meaning for them may be? Are they connected to a higher power? Is their faith important to them? Was it? How do we re-engage that? And then accomplishments. We all need to feel successful with things that we're doing in our day, our tasks, I don't know about you, but sometimes I have a bad day. I'm like, ugh, I didn't do anything right today. Days and days and days of not feeling like you've done anything right can really take a toll on your psyche. So when we look at these five pillars of someone's life to total well-being, part of how we establish rapport, we're not going to be able to just sit down and say, hi, Mrs. Smith, it's nice to meet you. Tell me about parts of your day that make you feel happy. We can go about investigating and getting to know these areas of someone's life by first establishing rapport. How deep and how, well, this goes back to time, which I know for all of us professionals is not easy, but our clients with dementia need us to find the time to make this a priority because it takes some time to establish trust and rapport, to ask questions about their life and what was important to them, who's important to them. Identify and understand family dynamics. This, um, the way we do it here at Dovetails, we typically talk to the influencers or the adult children first without the older adult involved and gain their insight into the needs and the family dynamics. And then we ask that we meet with the older adult directly without the influencer and without the adult children so that they have the, not just feel like they have, but they truly have the autonomy to speak their own truth. Tell me about your children. Obviously, depending on the level of cognitive ability, this can vary greatly. This is when things like a photo that's handy on, you know, we walk in and we see a family portrait when the children were young. Oh, these children are beautiful. You know, seeing where their level of ability to engage us in conversation. Oh, those are my children. Oh, really? Are they, are they still young? Oh, no, they're all grown now. They have grandchildren and great-grandchildren or whatever. We're able to establish rapport and not prompt them, but gauge where they're at in identifying uh, that situation. Determining what additional supports are in place. Is this someone who's attending the senior center regularly? which prompts us to know that maybe there's professionals at the senior center that may be able to help give us insight into the needs and the current situation of this older adult. Obviously the personal history, this is interesting um, because we do things a little bit differently, but we do not take a clinical approach. When we say personal history, we're not diving in to tell me about the medical needs. Um, it's important and it, it, it comes up in the process, but not in this establishing rapport. The personal history is tell me about your life. Tell me about your childhood. You know, who, where did you grow up? Do you have siblings? Um, it's not relevant that the siblings maybe recently passed away. That's not necessarily relevant unless the client brings that up to us, but really engaging them to get to know who are they at the core we all know, especially if you're on this call, that the current person presenting in front of us, they are still there. They're at a soul level, at an internal level. There are aspects of that person that are still there deep within. Let's connect with that person because we're probably going to have much more success getting more information from that inner child or that inner person than maybe their current state. So, oh, understanding their perceived timeline. This is with the family and with the older adult. Um, sometimes with our clients who are about to have a move and they have dementia, they're aware that something's going on. They may not be able to pinpoint to us that, oh, I'm moving to a memory care next week, but they're feeling the unrest. They're feeling that something's going on. So I just say, tell me about what's been going on recently and find out from them what is their perceived situation and timeline. They may recall that they have, I went somewhere recently. My daughter's been talking about uh, maybe 
moving to her house or going somewhere, but also talking to the family and the community. What is your perceived timeline? There is opportunity here as professionals to maybe insert some recommendations on maybe a different approach or a different timeline, but we have to find out what is the goal and the timeline that's currently on the table. And then identifying small action items. Okay, so I wanna give a real time example of this from a client uh, consultation last week. So I was invited by a professional to a consultation. This professional had been working with this client with dementia for quite some time. There's family dynamics. Um, I was brought in uh, as a move manager coming to help make a plan to pack and move. But I realized really quickly in this meeting that the client was nowhere near there yet. She was hyper-focused on her family, um, not family tree, like family history. She has spent literally the last 15 years putting together a super in-depth hundreds of, it went back to like the 1600s. It had chapters and pictures. It was really, really well done. Her cognitive decline is more recent in the last couple of years. And she was so proud to sit and tell me all about her family history, the, uh, where, you know, in depth. Her brother who helped her with this project died two years ago, early COVID. And so this led into conversation on sibling and, and, and grief and talking about losing him. And she went into missing church. Church was something she attended regularly. She hasn't been since COVID. And so I could tell the professional in the room was really taken aback that I was not there to measure furniture and talk about what to do with her items. Meanwhile, they had not even narrowed down the community they were moving to. I just felt that we weren't there yet. <clears throat> and what she kept talking about is that she needed to bring a copy of this book that was probably this large of her history. I'm going to, I'm not going to say this right, but it's like, like the archives in Boston. There's like a family history archive center. Please forgive my uh, ignorance for not saying this correctly. But she's been trying to get a copy of this book into Boston to this uh, historical location, and no one has taken her to do this. Her kids just haven't had time. And because everyone else is focused on the crisis at hand, the perceived crisis of finding a place and getting her moved. So I said to her, that's easy enough for us to do. Let's do that. Let's get this in town. We can make a day of it. We can go in. She's like, I haven't been in town forever. I'd love to go to lunch. I said, this would be such a fun afternoon. Let's go. Let's bring that to the uh, archives. What that process is going to do, one, she's so proud to bring this in town. Two, it's, a st it's allowing her and I to establish really deep trust and rapport. And I'm going to continue to get to know her on a deep level. So when the time comes for me and my team to actually sit and find items and pack and move, it's not random strangers coming in. It's people who have truly given the time to get to know her and establish trust and rapport. And it's giving me information to then pass on to the community and other influencers and people who are going to engage her in the process. And she is taking a copy of this book wherever she goes because it's such a beautiful engagement tool and opportunity to use with her. So that's a specific action item. To think in this meeting or multiple meetings that you're having with your clients. What is an, an actionable item that you can take to help? I also um, identified that there are vo transportation volunteers at her church. So let's get her engaged back in church while we continue down the path and hopefully find a community that has faith engagement opportunity. So let's, we don't have to take it all at once, all in one big bite. Let's take manageable bites to establish trust and rapport, get to know what's important to this person to help them move forward with ease. And then presentation versus reality. I think strongly that our senior living communities must spend more one-on-one -on -one time with the person with dementia in their environment to get a really good understanding of what's the reality versus the presentation. We had a client um, who presented very well at a community. We were referred to them to move them into what is called traditional assisted living, not memory care. And we went to do a consultation at this man's home and his presentation at the community was very different than his reality at home. We were dealing with an extremely chaotic um, hoarding, hoarding as a specialty here at Dovetail, hoarding situation. And 
extreme short-term memory loss and the community was not aware and it's not their fault. He presented well with short visits at the community. He worked really hard to save face um, and it was not a quick move in. It took probably four or five months and he ultimately moved into memory care um, with the right support and programming and he's thriving there today. But we had to change the timeline, the perceived timeline to make sure that this was successful. If this man was moved in tradition, into traditional memory care, he would have wandered and eloped probably day one and have been put in a hospital or rehab. And it would have been a very crisis move into memory care, which would not have set him or the community up for success. So what's the, what, how is the person presenting versus their reality? And again, for me, it takes time. It really takes time to figure out that situation. So I, ta I just talked a little bit about taking action uh, ahead of this slide, but what are some things that we can do? How do we engage this person to get to know them on a deeper level? I just gave a few examples. One thing we love to do as senior move managers, working with people, not just with cognitive impairment, but all older adults, is hearing their stories and getting to know them. And as we sort through their lifelong possessions, we get to engage in real deep conversations that lead us to see what's most important to them. This is a wonderful way to work with a senior move manager for people with dementia moving to create memory boxes through the process. So not only is the person able to establish trust and rapport and feel accomplished and successful telling their stories to us, we're able to identify what's most important to them and put those things together in a great redirection tool for the community to use at the community. I think these memory boxes could be a great tool to engage the community members. So the, the staff at the assisted living could come with the move manager to some of these, um, these packing uh, experiences at the home and start to see that engagement to be able to replicate that back at the community. Um, this is just an example here of a memory box of some items that um, you know could be used, but this allows the professionals to engage on a deeper level. And again, this would feel awkward if I had cognitive impairment, I didn't know you, and you just tried to have a forced intimate moment with me, like, oh, hi, Jane, I'm Erin, show me what is this? That doesn't flow well. It, it, it doesn't flow well. But if I like, know, and trust Erin, I've been working with Erin, I know her, I trust her, and Erin brings you and says, you know, this is my friend, she's here today, she heard all about your life uh, family history project, she'd love to hear about it. This person's going to be engaged at a deeper level in that conversation with that professional. So it's not just a great tool. I know sometimes when we don't have time and we have an immediate move in and people end up, you know, coming in with limited belongings, we try to do this with them at the community. It's not the same because we're not in their environment, in their home with their stories and their emotions. Um, so this is a real beautiful opportunity when given enough time. This is also a great activity to engage the influencer. When we don't have a professional, like a senior move manager, an expert involved to kind of steer this process, children are so busy, like rushing around to put items together that they don't have the always have the minute to sit down and do this, or they don't know to do this. This is a great way for an adult child to have a successful visit and engagement opportunity with mom or dad to hear about the stories. I think the saddest part for us here at Dovetail, we do provide bereavement services, meaning an older adult passes away and we come into seniors' homes and help the family deal with all of the contents at the home. And it breaks our heart when children say like, I don't know about any of these military. I never saw this, this um, you know, chest of my father's that's filled with all of his military memorabilia. He never told us those stories. And so this experience can give family members and friends beautiful opportunities to hear the stories. It's also very cathartic for the older adult to have the ability to tell those stories that maybe weren't told before, or maybe they've been told many times over, but it helps that person feel successful by telling the stories that are easy for them to tell. All right, so the third approach is the environmental approach. How do we 
truly recreate an environment to the best of our ability to set this person up for success on the other end? How do we take it all in, so to say? I think, unfortunately, in an el our, el our elder care industry here in America is task-focused and task-driven. And in my professional opinion, again, because we have limited time, you know, the visiting nurse has, I don't know, six, eight people she has to see in one day. How much time do you have to truly immerse yourself to do this work? But I'm going to say it again. Our dementia clients need this from us. We as an industry have to do better and we have to make the time. We need to immerse ourselves in their environment. We need to see how they live their day. Do they get out of the bed every day? I sleep on the right-hand side of my bed, okay? So if I moved into a place where I'm, and I, because I sleep on my right shoulder, so I, and I sleep on the right-hand side of my bed, I get out of the bed on the right side every day. These are things you wouldn't know unless you were in someone's environment seeing how they live. You know, I'm going to talk in a few slides about some very specific items in someone's environment, but we have to immerse ourselves to see how someone is living their day to best support them in this new environment. Um, I didn't include this in the slide, but I'd like to share this. This was shared with me over a decade ago at um, an Alzheimer's Association conference here in Massachusetts. Memory care communities uh, were described in this conference in a way that has sat with me and has helped me form this business and this approach that we take to people moving with living with cognitive impairment. When you lose a limb, if you're an amputee, you are created, you know, they create a prosthetic for you so that you can adapt, you know, the aesthetic, the, the, um, the arm is created for you so that you can live in an environment to the best of your ability after that loss. Memory care communities are an, are an environment that have been created to support the areas of someone's functional need, okay? So with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, we have lost the function and the ability in certain areas of our brain to do certain tasks, to engage in certain ways. Um, our vision, we'll talk about that as well. And so these environments are created to support those deficits. We can take that one step further when we know the functional needs of a client from their previous environment to this new environment. So there's small things like making sure the bed is positioned so that she can successfully get out on the right side every day, just as a small example that just came to my mind. But there's other things in that environment that we can successfully set up. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, absorbing what you're seeing and feeling, just be so present. If we're not coming in, if I had gone to that client's home with a checklist of my questions, that I had to check off, that I measured her furniture and talked about what artwork was important to her, I wouldn't have been able to be fully absorbed in her conversation about her ancestry lineage. So just be like, take it all in. But also I was absorbing what I was seeing around me. So I was able to engage her, but I was taking it all in. And there were some things there that um, she had music, she had um What's the word I'm looking for? Classical music playing pretty loud the entire time. So I was paying attention to that. I was able to talk to her about her love for music um, also, but just take that, absorb it all. Don't be so focused on the task at hand, be truly present. We don't listen enough. It's an 80, 20 rule. We should be talking 20% of the time and listening 80% of the time. And for all of you dementia experts, it should be even less talking than that. They're not able to process all the information we're sharing. Ask, if you, if you need help engaging in the environment, ask questions about specific items in their home. I once had a um, dementia move. The person was in rehab, was not gonna be able to return home before going. And so I took pictures of her environment at home and sat with her at the rehab and asked about items. At the foot of her bed, was a picture, I could tell it wasn't her. It was a, a wedding photo of two people. I didn't know if it was her parents or what, but it was at the foot of her bed for 60 plus years. So I had made an assumption that that was a really important picture for her and I should bring it and put it above, you know, at the end of her new bed. And she said, oh my God, my in-laws, they've been staring at me for 60 years at the foot of my bed. I don't like that picture. 
So ask about things in their home and you're going to hear stories that are relevant. The picture that she loved, she actually painted in her, I think she was 19 or 20 when she was studying abroad and it was at the head of her bed. So now that she had dementia, we were able to put that at the foot of her bed. So she woke up to something that reminded her of a really successful and lovely memory in her life. And she could talk to people in the community about that painting. We put that into her transition plan. Um, and then physically engaging in the process, asking them to show you around their home, to tell them stories, what's important to you. If there's an Afghan on the chair, or, you know, a blanket that's favorite or the chair that's all worn out, ask questions about those things. Um, identifying their perception versus reality, just gauging, gauging where they're at. And please, 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 everyone who's working with people with cognitive impairment, please use validation therapy. If you're not familiar with this, there's a separate training available. You can also find information online. Validation therapy places the emphasis on the emotional aspect of the conversation and less on the factual content, thereby imparting respect to the person, their feelings, and their beliefs. It is not up to us to orient someone with cognitive impairment into our reality. And this is the number one reason why I try to have as many meetings as possible without the adult children to engage the senior directly because it's not their fault, but they're not dementia experts and many haven't been trained. We train all of our caregivers on validation therapy as a technique for them to use with their loved one, but they typically want to redirect the conversation into, no, no, mom, that's not true. We're going to talk about this or that didn't happen. This did. It's a moot point. Our goal is to, as this states, focus on the emotional aspect, engage in the emotional aspect of the conversation to really establish trust and rapport. And that's a great technique to use when you're in their environment. Okay. So I want to highlight two unsuccessful memory care environments so that we can talk about how to do this the right way. So the one to the left is unfortunately kind of a common scene in defense of this in this unsuccessful environment. This person packs, there are personal belongings in this apartment, but he packs them up every day, um, which can be a common behavior. He's going home. Thank you for my time and my stay. I need to leave. So he, he puts all of his things um, and puts them away. This, again, if there's time and engagement opportunity, there's a way to successfully engage him in conversations around those items as you're putting them back out for him to say, well, we're not leaving today, but I'd love to hear more about these things. Tell me about them. And then placing them back out. Um, there's also no uh, uh, functionally, we're going to talk about functional environment. There's no way uh, to engage him in that space, like to have him sit and put his shoes on or to assist. If you look at to the picture to the right, it's chaotic. There's disorganization. Um, there's a lack of visual cues. It's, there's, it's, you're kind of like stuck in this space. There's, there's stuff everywhere. You could tell somebody would probably rummage through. There's too many items um, on the side table. So there's just, it may seem chaotic and hard for a caregiver to come in and sit the person down and engage. So we're gonna to get to what they look like when they're successfully done, but I wanna tell three quick stories about these three client situations. This yellow plastic mug will is a recent uh, dementia move that we did. So the daughters were leading the charge with this. They wanted to decide what to bring for mom and pack it all up. And when I was at the home, I noticed this pink, it's probably, it looks like mid-century, like 60s or 70s. I think we've all seen these plastic mugs was very well used and it sat next to the kitchen sink at home. And when they were packing up, uh, I think they she drank coffee twice a day. So they were packing up coffee, a couple of coffee mugs for her. And I said, well, what about this mug? And they said, oh my God, we've tried to throw that away through the years. It's my mom's crusty mug. She has her coffee in it every day. It's, we can't wait to get, we've literally thrown it away and she's taken it out of the trash. And I said, ladies, I know you mean well, this mug is coming and this mug is staying and she's having her coffee in it at the community when she has her coffee. And I explained why, that in a very unfamiliar environment, this coffee mug that has been a daily familiar staple to her is going to bring a level of comfort that other things can't do. So sometimes it's the real small things. A next example of environmental, and we would not have known that 
if we weren't in the house, like asking questions, right? She would have come with that other mug. And so now the team, by the way, has this mug to engage her with to say, hey, do you want a cup of coffee? And she sees that familiar mug and it feels good to her. This starfish, you can see this starfish, it's kind of hard with the white on white, but it's sitting on the doily. One of our move management team members, um, I didn't know this story, they told the story to me. This, this starfish actually contains the ashes of this client's son who passed away uh, many years ago. And the conversation around the loss of the son and the importance of this starfish came organically through conversation directly with this client. This isn't something that was told to us by an adult child. And this is prominently placed um, as soon as you walk into her room, she has it right. Obviously, the community also knows the importance of this. And she feels really emotionally connected to this, obviously. And it's an opportunity for her to work through her grief and loss and tell the story of her son uh, to all those that she feels that she wants to tell it to in the community. And so that was a really important piece for us to bring. And then this last piece, this is small, but it was really, it's funny. The adult children in this case had no idea what these figurines were, nor did they know the importance. So their father was a successful businessman. And every year at the company's like annual award ceremony or like annual banquet, he was given these little figurines, which I don't know if they're collector items. I don't know the resale value. Um, they were called, yeah, Sebastian's. And he, when we asked him about his work, he was so proud of his work. He led us to this little shelf in the corner of his sitting room and talked to us about every single one of these figurines that he was given each year. His children had no idea what these were. They never knew about this. And we took that little shelf and we put it in his apartment and he has been able to engage with the staff on the importance of his work because that made him feel really successful and proud. And it's something, again, if we weren't in his home, getting to know his stories and engaging him in conversation, we would have known. So it's a really small thing that can go a long way when we have the time. I just wanna talk about functional success in an environment. Yes, bringing things from home that are personal, but making them work in a way where there's opportunity for plenty of room for, you know, um, transitioning and that's not the word I'm looking for, um, transferring in and out of bed or to and from you know, environments using small tables, um, but keeping surfaces clear. One thing I think as an industry we've missed the mark on is adequate lighting. Um, if you are a dementia or Alzheimer's professional, you know that the disease has a major impact on our vision and our depth perception. So there shouldn't be pattern rugs or throw rugs because um, walking and shuffling and gait can become an issue. So making sure that these environments have adequate lighting. A lot of communities do not offer enough overhead lighting or the overhead lighting casts shadows, which is not great for folks with um, Alzheimer's disease in various dimensions. So we are always looking at lighting and opportunity for improving lighting, even within communities that have already been built, how can we adapt the environment? So thankfully, these are really simple things that we can do in someone's new space to make sure that there's adequate lighting, not just to address mood changes, but to have successful. So for example, we can do an easy swap out with um, outlet covers that will light up in the evening and if someone needs to walk to the bathroom, you know, making sure that these sensors are on and in the bathroom, or if there needs to be afternoon, we can set with the use of Alexa and other um, easy to use technology, we can have lighting and environments set to time of day to recreate sunlight to help minimize sundowning behaviors. So we definitely pay attention to the functional aspects of someone's new environment to make sure that they're set up for success as well. Um, we also also have a successfully aging in place at home with dementia training, which we incorporate a lot of this as well. This is something, these are small adaptations. We use this in our aging in place at home with dementia, but it can also be done in a new uh, bathroom environment in a community. Very simple changes that can be done in a bathroom. I won't go through all of this, but contrast changes, toilet seat, grab bars, handrails, swapping out for a color-coded contrast to successfully um, and preserve dignity for someone 
moving to a new environment, there are already may be challenges at home with some of the tasks in the bathroom. So we want to even one step further, minimize that in a new environment. Um, due to time, I'm kind of going through this quickly, but you can see there's a lot that can be done to adapt a bathroom for successful outcomes for personal care and toileting. How are we setting someone up for success? This is same for at home, but even more so in a new environment, making sure that we're labeling drawers. If someone is providing, um, you know, doing some of their personal care and dressing for themselves, helping them with minimal choices, you know, just underwear, socks, shirts, pants, if they're able to, to read and do that for themselves. You'll see in this environment that not only are there you know, the drawers are open and easy to access, but there are labels on those drawers. The, this picture was taken, there was a study done, and if you're interested, I'm happy to send this to you. There was a study done in care communities on successful outcomes for people's uh, ability, functional ability to stay independent with activities. And this was one of the communities they showcased that had a drastic change when uh, created and set up differently. This is an example of a successful setup of someone's apartment that has space for someone to move around. It has specific personal items that are of importance to them. Um, there, you'll notice the seating area to the right, there's actually another chair that's cut off that allows someone to sit and engage in conversation in the privacy of their apartment. That's a great redirection ability. There's also even small things, the stained glass that's laid over that window. Um, that's a very personal piece from their home to replicate the home environment as much as possible. So it just goes a long way for that person to feel a sense of familiarity in a new space. Um, and also additional lighting above and beyond the overhead lighting you'll notice in that space. So how do, we implement, how do we implement this? What's the implementation approach? How do we take all of this knowledge and put it into action? The first, we cannot, in my professional opinion, whenever possible, and we understand that there are gonna be outlying situations that don't fit this approach or this mold, it's not great when someone's moving. The day of moving is the first time that that person has seen the community. How do we have numerous visits for this person, successful short visits into the community so that it's a familiar environment? They may not remember the visits, but they remember the feeling that this place feels good and there's something familiar about it. So how do we have personal, purposeful engagement opportunities for that person. So I mentioned that woman who misses going to church. Maybe the memory care does have a faith-based activity once a week at the community. It would be wonderful to bring this person numerous times, just come have the faith experience and leave and associate the community with fulfilling that need that was identified. Maybe it's um, there's another woman that has been interested in familial history. Let's, I'd love for you to come and teach them about your project that you did with your family history. Maybe you bring your prospective resident with that book in for an activity where she's telling people about how she did this project and then she leaves. So uh, when possible, I would recommend four to five visits for that person to have short visits purposely identified to meet their need. It's someone who loves to cook or bake. They're coming in for a cooking class or whatever it may be. Make it specific to the need of that person that you've identified and include their influencers. I feel strongly it's up to all of us as the professionals who support these families to be the expert and the professional and allow the child or the caregiver to stay in that role allow them to just come for the experience and engage in the experience as well and not feel that they have to manage and handhold their loved one, allow all of us to be the professionals to do that handhold and that engagement so that they can also start to acclimate and assimilate into this new environment multiple times before the day of move-in. Having the community staff at the prospective resident's home numerous times if possible. And I don't think it should be the sales and marketing person. I think maybe early on it should be, but really it's the team that's going to be providing the care, the direct care or the one coordinating the care plan. And again, I or the program, the person who's going to be doing the engagement with programs. How can we have an 
my advice is the same person. If we have five different team members at five different visits, that's not allowing that individual to establish deep trust and rapport with that community team member that's going to be the one that's really involved. Um, it also, I think, allows the family to see how involved the team really is and will be in the process once you're there. So if it is someone who's just beginning the process and touring, I think it'll help close the sale when the family experiences, it's not just the salesperson, it's the team that's getting to know my mom and it's giving them peace of mind with this transition. It also just gives that team member insight into the environmental needs of that person. I've noticed, um, you know, furniture walkers, they're not using their walker, they're, they're using furniture. Um, how are we gonna get ahead of that? So when they're at the community, we're all on board to encourage use of walker, whatever it might be. You're gonna see that at home. You're gonna know to bring the plastic cup. Slow and consistent engagement with the older adult. This just gives time to establish rapport. Okay, this one's a big one. This is for all of the nurses and case managers that may be on this call or senior living referral companies. Whoever is establishing all of the inside information back at the house, you have to have that communication with the community. So for example, when I was, excuse me, brought into that uh, scenario earlier where they thought that this was a traditional assisted living move-in, we could have supported that and moved, barged forward, but it wouldn't be successful. We had very open and honest communication with the community that we feel strongly this is not a traditional assisted living move-in, that we need to do this in a different way to give this person support and the family support for a memory care move um, in the coming months. So open, honest communication between all parties um, and feedback. And that should be both ways, to and from. No one's, we're all in this tribe together, supporting the needs of this older adult. And so we all need to get on the same page. And by the way, we didn't talk about this, but maybe not the, the maybe the best professionals are not involved in having that communication. We've had, um, you know, elder law attorneys that are really pushing for mass health nursing home planning and the family and the older adult don't need or want a nursing home. So maybe we need to make strong recommendations of other professionals that need to be involved to support the goals and wishes for that client. Adapt and change the plan as necessary. One thing on this call we all know for sure is that life is unpredictable, the dementia is unpredictable, people are unpredictable. So we're going to have to assess and change as needed. We cannot put a rigid plan in place. We can take these approaches and this information and do the best we can and then flex and be adaptable as things change. This is really important to me uh, and the biggest challenge that we find that we've built out with our successful Dementia Moves program here at Dovetail. Um, but I think we can do a better job as an industry across the board. There needs to be a slow exit of the supporting professionals who've supported through this process. Through COVID, we supported families in transition. And due to the obvious restrictions at the community level, we had to exit after the move. And our families and our clients felt the exit. It was like, what we, where are you? We need you. This has been successful. So how, if you're the visiting nurse or the social worker or someone involved, if you can, at least for the first few weeks, 30 or 60 days of transition, every once a week or every other week, give that warm handhold. If you are their person, their trusted support person, how can you make a slow exit with them so that they feel that you're still involved and give support to the community? Remember, it's like, um, you know, bringing your child to daycare. They're they get to come home to you at the end of the day, residents don't, right? So the staff that's providing care to this person now needs a little time to really be all in and get to know them. So the more that we can support and make that caregiving transition a slow handover, the better success for everyone, including the staff at the community. We created um, a system here at Dovetail called Lifestyle Management, where essentially it's having someone involved a few hours, one or two days a week, helping with that transition. So the person's not feeling like, you know, there was just a, a blunt exit. This is a quote we recently put on social media that I wanted to add just to re, re um, state that this doesn't have to be so hard. Too often we underestimate the power of a touch, a smile, 
a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn a life around. We're so focused on the crisis and the diagnosis of the person, we're not taking a minute to just be present with them. And I think that's the biggest change agent is let's just all be present as much as possible, join them in their journey, and it can go much smoother when we take the time. So here at Dovetail Companies, um, we provide care options counseling, lifestyle management, move management and planning, education and awareness, and we are a seniors real estate specialist company helping families with the overwhelming process of listing and selling the longtime home when needed. Please like and follow us at Dovetail Companies on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, and visit us anytime at dovetailcompanies.com.